Good day, everyone. Welcome to our webinar for May 2022. Um, we've got quite a lot of ground to cover, and I'd like to begin by just having a quick look at what's going on in the middle of Europe, in Central Europe. Obviously, the war in the Ukraine has shifted. It's now they've, the Russian troops have withdrawn from Kiev and they're concentrating in the Donbass area. I think this has been a major setback for Russia. Uh, but obviously it does have advantages. They've got much shorter lines of communication. And it's apparent that they have a, committed a much larger portion of their amb army to a far less ambitious goal. But they haven't changed their tr strategy or tactics. They're still doing a kind of World War II blitzkrieg, hoping to overcome their more nimble opponents with massive firepower and large numbers. But Ukraine has gained considerably from this uh, two months that they've been in this war and obviously they were in the war a long time before that from 2014 but in the last two months they've learned a tremendous amount um, they've been systematically rearmed by NATO uh, including with heavy weapons and um, they're even making strikes inside Russia which is interesting but the fighting in the Donbass region has been very intense with both sides taking heavy casualties. A few more small concessions have been yielded by the Ukrainians, but nothing significant. In fact, for all intents and purposes, at this stage, it seems as if they are fairly well matched and we have something of a stalemate on our hands. Of course, Russia cannot afford a long drawn out war. The enormous economic strain from the sanctions which it's under is beginning to have an effect. The probability of an insurrection in Russia is rising. The Donbass is Russia's final hope of success. If they fail a second time, they will certainly lose Ukraine and possibly even Crimea. Then Putin will almost certainly lose control of Russia itself. There is, of course, an outside possibility that the situation will return to what it was before this war began. Um maybe with some small territorial gains for Russia along the Black Sea. But this scenario is clearly not sustainable because of the sanctions which the West has imposed on Russia. The Russian economy is not very big. It's only about the size of Texas, the state of Texas in the United States. It cannot sustain itself with the war and sanctions for much longer in our view. Our opinion is that Vladimir Putin will be ousted sooner or later, probably by somebody in his inner circle. Already there are questions about his health. Um, they are saying that he has cancer and possibly Parkinson's disease. The progress of the war, of course, has damaged his position as a supreme dictator. If and when he departs, we will see an inevitable situation. Um, Russia will probably become another capitalist democratic European country. That's how we see it unfolding. We see Putin getting removed somehow, one way or another, and then Russia becoming, over a period of time, a capitalist democratic European country. In fact, we even see that it could eventually join NATO in time. In other words, the Ukraine war, as it is now, is really the final kick in the Soviet anachronism. There is an outside possibility, of course, that the war could escalate into a nuclear war. Russia's Sergei Lavrov has talked about that increasing danger. But we see this talk of nuclear war from the Russians as saber-rattling and probably a sign of their desperation. Nuclear war would see the complete annihilation of Russia. No doubt Europe and America would suffer horrendous damage, but nothing compared to what would be done to Russia. Of course, it's impossible to make predictions about this scenario, and we just have to hope that someone in Russia can see the futility of it. In our view, Ukraine has been substantially discounted into the markets. Barring an unforeseen escalation, the JSE will probably be impacted less and less by events in Central Europe. The primary effects on our market 
are of course the rising petrol price and also the boom in commodities. All right, let us turn our attention now to America. On the screen you see I've put the S&P 500. Uh, the comments made by Jerome Powell uh, over here, you can see where they impacted on the chart here, uh, on the 21st of April. He spoke about a uh, 50 basis point hike in, in interest rates uh, at, the, at the Monetary Policy Committee meeting, which is due to report back today. And then that would be followed by further 50 basis point rate hikes going forward. He also spoke about a, uh, a reduction in the size of the Federal Reserve Bank's balance sheet. Um, this is obviously the opposite of quantitative easing. easing. We call it quantitative tightening. And uh, he's expecting to do that by some $95 billion a month. So this is a massive and accelerated shift in monetary policy in America. The U.S. has been behind the curve, in our opinion. It should have been raising interest rates from last year already. At that time, of course, they thought that the 5% inflation, which they had back then, was temporary, and that inflation would come back under control. Far from doing that, it has actually accelerated. In March month this year, inflation in America reached 8.5%. And that is more or less forcing the Fed to move. The St. Louis Fed president, James Bullard, says that rates have to go to 3.5% this year. That would, of course, require a series of 50 basis point hikes, causing significant bearishness in the market. At the same time, as this has been going on, all this negativity, the S&P 500 companies have been reporting their earnings for the March quarter. About one-third of them, or 176, have reported their earnings so far, and they are comfortably above analyst expectations. 80% of them have beaten analyst expectations, which shows that the boom in America is continuing. If you look at the chart here, you can see now the anatomy of this correction. It initially fell quite steeply and then came down to this uh, bottom level here uh, and made a double bottom, in fact, in March. Uh, we believed that that was, in fact, the lowest point. Uh, we've been proved wrong now because we obviously made a lower point uh, here on the 29th of April. But this was really caused by um, the fear, which is in, in, in the markets at the moment, of this tightening monetary policy, not just in America, but all over the world. Nonetheless, it does seem that this level is holding. You'll notice that the intraday low here was at 4114, and we've sort of remained above that. And we see now uh, some sort of stabilization. Um, so anyway, we, our view remains pretty much the same, that, that uh, the correction is more or less over, that what we are looking at is a buying opportunity. We certainly do not see this as any kind of... Um, bear trend developing. We see it as a correction and a buying opportunity. Uh, back in November last year, we did predict a, a major correction before this correction actually even began. Two months before it began, we predicted that there would be a major correction. And we said it would probably go down to between 10 and 20%, which is roughly where it is now. 20% takes it all the way down to 3680, the, the S&P. From its current level at about 4175, it would have to fall quite significantly to get to 3680, and we do not think that that is probable. We think, in fact, that it will remain above 4000. And, of course, we reiterate, this is a correction and not the start of a bear trend. Therefore, it remains a buying opportunity. It's interesting to compare the S&P 500 with the JSC overall index. If we can just look at this chart, I think you'll find it quite interesting. Here, yeah, what you can see on the, on the screen, in the top half of the chart is the JSC overall index, and the bottom half of the chart is the relative strength of the JSC overall index against the S&P 500. And what you can see here is that the JSE 
has been outperforming the S&P 500 since November last year. So that's quite interesting. While the, while the S&P has gone through a major correction, our market has come down, but not nearly as much. And in fact, it's been mostly moving sideways while the S&P has been offloading. So that's quite an interesting uh, picture to look at. Before we look at the South African economy in, in, in more detail, I'd like to just um, spend a little time considering the progress of economic reform in this country over the 28 years that the ANC has been in power. A long time ago in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, an economist in the United Kingdom by the name of John Williamson proposed a set of 10 reforms which had to be undertaken by any economy which was trying to um, normalize itself and return to growth. Of course, he, he was at the time thinking of the Russian economy um, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Berlin Wall. But it's very interesting to take those 10 points that he raised and look at them in the context of South Africa. So I'll just quickly go through them and and comment on them. The first point is fiscal discipline and the avoidance of large government deficits. Obviously in South Africa our fiscal discipline was pretty good under Trevor Manuel while he was the finance minister but then with the rise of Zuma there was a lot of looting and state capture and the fiscal deficit um, deteriorated substantially. Since the Ramaphosa administration came into power, they have made Herculean efforts to reduce that deficit, and they've been helped by the commodity boom, which has increased tax revenue, and the situation is slowly coming back into control. So on that score, I think we're doing reasonably well at this stage. The second point is the redirection of public spending away from subsidies towards and towards pro-poor services like health, education, and infrastructure. Well, of course, we all know that since the ANC came into power, these pro-poor services have suffered, education and health most notably. Instead, we have seen the rise of grants. In fact, now SASA, um, the, the South African sec security uh, agency that provides these grants, has five different grants that it provides, Altogether, uh, and there, there, there's an old age grant uh, for people over the age of 60, a disability grant, a child support grant, a foster child grant, and a veterans grant. And now, of course, to that is added the new social relief of distress grant, which has now been extended for another year at the cost of 44 billion rand. At this stage, about 40% of non-interest government spending is used to pay these grants. The effect has been to subsidize people who do not or cannot work for various reasons. And that has been done instead of empowering them, of course, with education and health and by improving the infrastructure, the roads, the railways, the, the whole infrastructure, the internet and so forth. All right, the third point which Williamson makes is about tax reform. He says that we should have moderate taxes and we should strive to broaden the tax base. Well, of course, um, since we got rid of Tom Moyani as the man in charge of SARS, um, things have been improving. But Moyani did a lot of damage to SARS, and uh, that damage has got to be repaired first. Huge efforts have been made in this area, and I think the tax base has remained, has, has grown a little bit, but it still remains narrow. Uh, and of course, there's a growing uh, informal sector in South Africa. The informal sector is really just a euphemism for tax evasion. Uh, corporate taxes, of course, have been reduced by 1% using the uh, bonanza from commodities. And that bonanza has also been used to reduce government debt, of course. And then the, the next point that Williamson makes is that interest rates must be market determined and must be positive in real terms. In other words, if you take the interest rate and subtract inflation, you need to end up with a positive number, not a negative number. 
And of course, on this point, America now has negative real interest rates because their inflation rate is 8.5% and their interest rates are, are well below that. So they actually have negative real interest rates in America, which is never a good thing. But here in this country, um, our monetary policy has been probably the single greatest achievement of the ANC. The Reserve Bank has resisted state capture and kept inflation low over the last 28 years. This, of course, has helped us to counter the impact of COVID-19, and we are now one of only five emerging currencies in the world out of 31 that is actually up against the US dollar this year, which is quite amazing. Then Williamson said that we must have competitive exchange rates. Well, the RAND is traded in a very liquid market. In fact, it is the benchmark for emerging market currencies. About 50 billion Rand a day passes through that market. And this, of course, instills confidence in overseas investors, which, of course, results in foreign direct investment. So that's all going quite well. If we, the next point that Williamson makes is competitive exchange rates. Um, the RAND is traded, uh, sorry, is trade liberalization. Apologize for that mistake. This, of course, is, is a bit of a thorny subject. Free trade is obviously ideal if you can get it. But this government, uh, ANC government, has shown the inclination to impose tariffs on certain industries, most notably in the cement industry, the chicken industry, and to a lesser extent in the steel industry. All of these industries are high bulk, low value products. So it amazes me that uh, the Pakistanis, for example, can manufacture cement in Pakistan and ship it here for less than we can manufacture it here. That doesn't seem to be correct, and we shouldn't really pr be protecting an industry like that, in my opinion. Of course, any type of protection like this causes prices, domestic prices, to be higher. The next point that Williamson talks about is foreign direct investment. Of course, this has been a major area of, of uh, emphasis for Ramaphosa, and he's done very well here with his conferences. Um, obviously, foreign direct investment is impeded to some extent and, and retarded by policies of BEE and also our very onerous labor laws, which tend to discourage overseas investors from investing in this country. A major positive, though, has been the stability of the RAND. As is, of course, our stable and sophisticated banking sector. These things encourage overseas investors to bring their money into the country. Then the penultimate point that Williamson makes is that you should engage in a process of privatization of state-owned enterprises. Well, of course, this is a, is a political hot potato. Even the word privatization is taboo in this country, in, in, in political circles. But there is the example of telecom. Uh, which is, although it's still controlled by the, by the government, um, basically is run by private enterprise and has done very well. And then, of course, we have all these failing SOEs like Eskom, Denel, the SA Post Office, the SABC, and so forth. In fact, there are about 200 SOEs in South Africa. Many of them are making a loss and are a strain on the fiscus. Selling them would generate funds to reduce the government debt. Finally, the final point which Williams makes, Williamson makes is that you must have security for property rights. And of course, this is also a major issue in South Africa and quite political. Land distribution is highly contentious in this country and the subject of considerable populist rhetoric. But for the economy to grow properly, property rights have to be sacrosanct. As soon as you interfere with property rights, you scare away foreign investors. And that is going to run exactly counter to what Cyril Ramaphosa is trying to do. So obviously this is the final, the final issue. So anyway, it's just worth looking at the South African economy in terms of those 10 different points that he makes. Uh, obviously, um, these are all contained in the notes. So if you want to get more detail or go back over this, uh, go and have a look at the notes. All right, turning to the economy itself, I see the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, rose to 5.9% in March, which is very close to the upper end of the target range. There was also an unexpectedly large jump in the producer price inf inflation, 
or index in March 2022. Obviously, that is the inflation rate at the factory gate. These things mean that the Monetary Policy Committee will almost certainly raise rates by half a percent at its May meeting this, this in, in, in 2022. And probably there will be two more hikes later on this year. We have a considerable amount of flexibility in our monetary policy because of our low inflation rate. However, we do want to keep our rates ahead of those in the first world countries so that there's a continued inflow of funds into our bond market. Obviously, the, the Monetary Policy Committee must also be very careful not to snuff out the nascent recovery that is going on in the South African economy. The economy has grown faster than expected so far this year. Inflation in South Africa is expected to peak around 6% and then fall in 2023 and 2024. The latest report from the IMF from the International Monetary Fund says that South Africa will be protected from the downturn in the world economy, mostly because of its commodity exports. It does, however, warn that inflation, world inflation, will stay higher for longer and that central banks will raise interest rates. The war in Ukraine is a factor because of the rising oil price. And now it's probably appropriate to just look at that rising oil price. Um, it's been quite an interesting pattern and it's, it's quite a good way to measure the true impact of the Ukrainian war. I'm just going to put a couple more, bit more data on the screen here. Uh, just take us back to COVID. There's the impact of COVID which saw the oil price come right down to below $25 a barrel. And then you can see that from that point in April 2020, the oil price has been rising steadily within a channel defined by these upper and lower channel uh, lines, but that the Ukraine war took it out of that channel on the upside. And it peaked at $125 a barrel um, on the 8th of March. And since then, it has been trending down. It has been very volatile, but it has, the trend has been downwards, and it's now back within these channel lines. Um, we see the oil price continuing to fall, um, slowly possibly, and with considerable volatility, but we see it con continuing to fall, which will obviously help the world economy and will reduce inflationary pressures. And as it stands now, it's trading at around $105 a barrel for North Sea Brent oil. And obviously that is a lot better. That's $30 a barrel better than its peak. Um, so there's some good news on the oil front uh, there. New car sales in South Africa were up strongly in March. 50,600 units were sold. That's up 16.5% on last year, March last year. And it shows that consumers and businesses are feeling a little bit more confident. Vehicle exports, however, were down, mainly because of the events in Ukraine and supplier constraints. The Natal floods came on top of the civil unrest that we had last year, and they put enormous strain on the, on the uh, economy in Natal. The president, of course, has promised further support for them. We think that these floods in, <coughs> floods in Natal were really a symptom of climate change because the, the amount of rainfall was just beyond anything in the records. There was huge damage done to the sugarcane industry and a lot of small sugarcane growers may well not survive this. <coughs> of course, it's also been very bad for the insurance companies. In South Africa, a major problem is the theft of metal infrastructure. It's a huge problem for Telcom, Transnet, Eskom, and a number of other state-owned enterprises. The direct cost has been estimated at about 7, 7 billion rand per annum. But the knock-on costs of not having proper communications, of not being able to transport product to the, to the, to the ports, is estimated at about 180 billion rand a year. Much of the stolen metal is exported as scrap. The CEO of Score Metals says that an Eskom pylon fetches about 9,000 rand a ton. So you can see why this is going on, because it's, it's a very uh, lucrative business. 
the police have been virtually unable to stop it, despite increased arrests and convictions. And the CEO of Score Metal says that we should actually not allow the export of scrap metal at all. We should stop it. But of course, that would put tens of thousands of recyclers out of business, you know, the so-called bin pickers. Turning our attention now to Eskom, <clears throat> its fleet of 43 uh, of power stations, its fleet of, 40, uh, of 43 power stations is now over 40 years old on average. It has frequent unscheduled breakdowns and that leads to load shedding as we know. In the year to March 2022, Eskom spent about 7 billion rand on diesel to run its turbines to try and counter load shedding. Despite that, we still ended up in stage four load shedding in April, which was a blow to the economy. Over the next three years, about eight gigabytes of renewable energy could be added to the grid. And it's apparent that Eskom is now relying on this renewable supply. There have been public spats between es the Eskom board and the uh, the and Scopa, and R President Ramaphosa has had to intervene. But Eskom is dying, in our opinion, and obviously it's a very very difficult situation indeed, causing huge damage to the economy. Uh, but we are making the transition to renewable energy. More and more businesses and private consumers are moving away from Eskom, and making their own arrangements. All right, let's look at the RAND now. <clears throat> Just to put that chart on the screen here. Right, here's the RAND. Let's uh, take it back to two years. I, if you look at this chart here, you can see that the RAND was in a strengthening trend. And then, of course, we had the July civil unrest and that, that caused the RAND to weaken quite significantly. Then from about November, end of November last year, it started to strengthen again, and it was strengthening very nicely. This little bump here, by the way, was the Ukraine war, which didn't have a significant impact. And in fact, Ukraine has really not impacted on the RAND that much. What did impact the RAND, of course, was Jerome Powell's comments about the U.S. Fed tightening up that would raise interest rates in America and make the uh, RAND, uh, well, RAND-denominated bonds less attractive. And obviously it also caused a shift towards risk on, and that caused investors to withdraw their money from emerging market currencies and return to safe haven currencies like, like the US dollar. So the effect of that has been a, a pretty sharp weakening of the RAND. Um, and this is... This move here is almost entirely because of rising inflation in the U.S. and the Federal Reserve Bank's uh, intended response to try and control that inflation. We don't think it will last very long. We think that um, that effect is more or less discounted into the markets and into the RAND, and we so we expect the strengthening trend to resume. As you know, our opinion is that the RAND is basically underpriced against first world currencies, and that uh, in the absence of external stimulants like Jerome Powell's comments or any uh, economic stupidities which are undertaken by our government, um, the RAND will strengthen. All right, let's look at some companies now. Um, I want to just start off by just looking at Sibanye. Uh, <clears throat> we all know about Sibanye. It's a fantastic success story. Um, Going to put a bit of data on the screen here. You can see how Sabanya has been going up very nicely. I'll take this off because it's not relevant anymore. Um, what is interesting is that they are currently experiencing a strike <coughs> where AMCU and NUM, the NUM, uh, are on strike at the gold mines um, and they've been on strike since the 7th of March. So far, this has cost workers about a billion rand in wages, lost wages. It's also, of course, cost uh, uh, Sibania some lost gold production, but it, Sibania's entire gold operation in South Africa is only 7% of its total revenue, so I don't think it's a major effect. The unions have tried to extend the strike to the platinum mines unsuccessfully. 
They've also turned down an offer from Sibanya, a, a sweetened offer from Sibanya, mainly because of news of Neil Froneman's uh, wage package or, or pay package uh, last year, which was a massive 300 million rand. So the unions obviously look at that and they get very upset. But it is noteworthy, noteworthy that the bus workers have just settled their strike and accepted a 6% wage increase, which is far less than Sibanya workers have been offered. So I don't think the strike will go on uh, indefinitely. And what is interesting is it hasn't really had a major impact on the Sibanya share price. The share is still in a strong upward trend, as you can see. The next share I want to look at is one of my favorites, uh, Clicks. You know I've talked about this share in, at Norseam on these programs, and really it is a share that you should have in your portfolio. Um, just going to put a bit more data on the screen here. Uh, even more than that. Even more. Let's go to here. Right, here you can see. <clears throat> this is a long-term chart showing uh, the progress of the click share price. Um, <clears throat> and, and what is interesting is that 20 years ago, over here, you could have bought this share for 5 Rand 90 20 years ago. 5 Rand 90. Today, it's trading for 310 Rand. And throughout that 20-year period, it's been paying excellent dividends. In fact, in its results for the six months to the 28th of February this year, which were excellent as usual, its turnover was up 9% and its headline earnings per share rose by 26%. It managed in that six months to return 530 cents to shareholders, 530 cents per share, which is a total of 1.3 billion. That was returned both through dividends and share buybacks. So this is an excellent share. As you can see, it's a diagonal. It's going up diagonally from the bottom left-hand corner of your screen to the top right-hand corner. And we believe that it should be part of any private investor's uh, portfolio. The next share I want to look at is Coronation. Uh, Coronation is a share which is quite interesting to me because a while back I made some good money in this share. I'm just going to put 10 years of data on the screen and just actually bring in a little bit more so that I can show you what has been happening. Okay, now what I want to say about Coronation is that uh, on the 9th of January in 2012, I bought uh, a large parcel of Coronation shares for 23 Rand and 20 cents. My reason for buying them was that at the time, the dividend yield was at 7.41%. 7.4%. Now, normally, when you have a high-quality share trading on the JSC, the average dividend yield should be around 2.5%. So if you can find a quality share which is trading on a dividend yield above 5%, you should pay attention because if it's going to return to 2.5%, then the share price has to double, and that is always good business. That's what every investor is looking for. And this particularly, by the way, applies to the banks. If you find one of the big banks trading on a dividend yield of 5% or worse, then you should certainly look at buying it because sooner or later that, that share price will go up. And you'll notice that during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, the... Uh, Dividend yield of Standard Bank, for example, and FNB went above 5%. Not for very long, but it did go above, and that was your buying opportunity. So the same thing applies here. This share was, uh, in January 2012, was trading on a dividend yield of 7.4%, so I bought it. Over the next uh, three years, the share went up amazingly and eventually reached a peak at 115 rand a share uh, in December 2014. And then it started to tail down. The CEO of the company resigned and was replaced by somebody else, which is never a good sign. And I finally lost my nerve over here and sold out because um, when the share went down, it broke this bottom here, the cycle bottom. That scared me out of it. And I sold for 90 Rand a share. But I made almost 400% in three years. And of course, because I held the shares for three years, that gain was treated as a capital gain. And I was taxed in those days at the rate of 16% on my capital gain. So that was an excellent piece of business. 
That, by the way, is one of the things you should do as a private investor. Try and hold on to your shares for three years or longer because then the receiver will only tax you on capital gain. He will not treat you as a share dealer. If, you're, if you become a share dealer, then your capital gains will be, tra will be uh, treated as income and will be added to your taxable income and taxed accordingly, which means you could pay up to 45% of your capital gain in tax. So it's always better to hold your shares for three years. And in fact, when I'm looking at a share to buy it, I always ask myself, where will this company be in three years' time? Because that's the important thing for me. What you can see, however, is that Coronation has been trending down for a long time now. Uh, here, Over here is COVID-19, the impact, the downward spike of COVID-19. It's recovered from that, but still seems to be trending down to me. And uh, But it's once again on a dividend yield which is starting to look really attractive. It's on a dividend yield around 9% now. It's not the blue chip share it once was, but I think it's getting interesting again, and I'm starting to look at it. So that's something for you to think about. Okay, the next share I want to look at is Pepcor. Pepcor, of course, is a retailer, very well known in South Africa. Um, about two years, I think. All right, now, uh, th th this share... Is, is seven is a retail group. It's held 71% by Steinhoff. And of course, you know what it includes. It's got the Pep stores, which are very well known, Ackermans, Hi-Fi Corporation, and also Bradlow's. Those all belong to Pepcor. Obviously, it took a bit of a hit when Steinhoff admitted to accounting regularities a little while back. But in the latest trading statement for the six months to the 31st of March, 2022 headline earnings per share were up 22.3 percent well they, they expected to be between 22.3 and 31.9 percent which is a big achievement considering where the economy is at the moment and also following the floods in Natal if you look at the chart here you can see it's in an upward trend obviously it's a retail share um, and it formed an island over here in September at about 10 rand a share you can see this island formation and since then it's been trending up quite nicely it's now at about 20 rand a share and to us it looks cheap it will it's one of those shares that will do well as the economy recovers then finally i'd like to talk a little bit about south 32 we don't usually advise uh, investors to buy uh, commodity shares or, or gold mining shares but in this case we think that this share is worthy of your attention um, let's see, let's put two years on. No, I think that's not enough. Uh, here you can see again, we start from COVID. You can see that the share fell off quite steeply with COVID, but has been recovering since then. Of course, uh, South 32 is a diversified mining house. It was spun out of BHP Billiton in 2015. It has a lot of base metals that it mines, uh, zinc, coal, aluminium, silver, nickel, manganese, all those things. It operates in South Africa, Australia, and in South America. And it, it, it bundled up its Eskom coal assets, those, those coal mines which were supplying Eskom, and separately uh, listed them in the form of Ceriti on the 1st of June 2020. It's now bought 100% of Arizona mining, which the CEO, Graham Kerr, says is a very exciting base metal operation. It's benefiting from the boom in commodity prices, during the six months, they bought 1.4 billion rands worth a billion dollars worth of their own shares back, so that's obviously a benefit for shareholders. <clears throat> and we see the share is continuing to move up strongly over time. It is volatile, of course, because it's a commodity share, but it is quite well diversified, and we think it has strong potential. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's all I have for you today. I hope that you found something of interest in that talk. And um, you should go and look at the notes if you can. And otherwise, I'll talk to you again on the first Wednesday in June. Thank you for listening to me.